Okay, hello and welcome everyone to tonight's All Under One Banner Zoom panel on strategies for independence. Um, so a warm welcome to everybody that's joining us tonight. Hopefully there's lots of uh, lots of people going to join in on Zoom, um, which is your opportunity to ask your questions direct to our, our four panellists this evening. So we've got uh, Tommy Sheridan, we've got Ruby Hirsch, uh, we have Angus McNeil, and we've got Denise Finlay who are going to answer the questions. Um, so without further ado, let's crack on and I'm going to pass you over to Suzanne, who's going to outline how the meeting is going to progress. Hi there, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. I just want to outline how it's going to work. The people that are in the Zoom chat with us just now, you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, but we'd also ask if you could type your question with a Q at the start into the chat at the side, and just so that it helps things run smoothly so that we can get an idea of what the subject of the question is before it's asked, and we will bring you in to ask your question. So without further ado, we'll start with our opening comments and I'd like to bring in Denise first with her opening comments and everybody has four minutes each. Thank you. Oh, she's still muted. Hello, September the 18th, 2014, if we could have seen the future, if we could have seen Boris Johnson in 10 Downing Street, our European citizenship gone, our Parliament stripped of its powers, Scotland would have, without any doubt, voted yes. So where are we today? We seem a different nation from the nation that held Scotland's future in its hands. We have we worked as if we are living in the early days of a better nation? Is it hope over fear? Or are we passively waiting for change to come as long as we beg Boris Johnson hard enough? Today there is a plan for a route to independence, a very bad plan, a plan that gives power to our opponents, a plan that has no chance of success. And one of the worst things about the plan, by promoting it as the gold standard, other perfectly reasonable routes to independence are undermined. The plan is to ask Boris Johnson to be a Democrat, to be reasonable, to respect Scotland. It is a plan to ask Boris Johnson to transfer the power to hold an independence referendum from Westminster to the Scottish Parliament. This is known as a Section 30, referring to Section 30 of the Scotland Act, and would require to pass in both Houses of Parliament. Boris Johnson has a mandate not to grant a Section 30, and polling shows his voters, both in the UK and in Scotland, want him to stick to that mandate. There is no advantage and considerable disadvantage for Boris Johnson to grant a Section 30. So it's not going to happen. And any politician that tells you it will is lying to you. So we should never mention Section 30 again because it is not happening and we must stop fooling ourselves and others by pretending it might. But what of the other pieces that need to be in place in order to fight for our independence? Ring fenced cash. I'm surprised there is not more outrage as to where this money has gone. It's quite scandalous really, and people are just shrugging. Policies, as far as the public are concerned, independence policy is frozen with the 2014 white paper. There has been no attempt to communicate anything else to them. Even though with Brexit, the landscape has changed. The civil service are not working on policies for an independent Scotland. They haven't worked on it since 2014. And the SNP have not produced a policy paper in nearly two years. So where are the policies to fight on? Legality, 
Martin Keatons is now trying to find out the legality. The Scottish government could have been to court at any point in the four and a half years since the EU ref to establish the legality of the Scottish Parliament calling an Indian ref. The fact they haven't is a bit of a death dereliction of duty. And now we're expected to trust Keith Brown, who will write the manifesto under Nicola Sturgeon's direction, to put words in that manifesto, which will give us an unshakable mandate to choose independence at some point in the next five years. It won't happen. They haven't got the policies, they haven't got the money, they haven't got the legal certainty, and they haven't got the fight. They have led Scotland to this disaster of hard Brexit and the power grab. They are not going to suddenly change and become fantastic strategists. When people show you who they are, you should believe them. We are going to have to do this ourselves. We need to make change happen, be the change, put Scotland's future back in Scotland's hands. That was great, Denise. Thank you very much. And just to remind our panellists, there's four minutes that you've got to uh, outline your, your opening comments. Um, if it's going to go on to about 3.30, we'll give you a 30 second uh, heads up so you can, you can wrap it up. So next up is Ruby Hush. Thanks. Uh, so the need for independence from the chaos of the Tory government is obviously more urgent than ever. We've, we're facing a really bleak triple-edged crisis. Uh, the COVID crisis has been criminally mismanaged. We've got the third de worst death toll in the world proportionally. Um, the economic crisis in Britain, they're now saying, is possibly the worst in 300 years. And the environmental crisis. So 2020 was the joint hottest year on record and the Tories show absolutely no signs of slowing our toxic emissions. Instead, they expand the airports and, and continue to frack the landscape. So it's, it's really a matter of life and death for some of us that in Scotland we start doing things radically differently and we rip the reins away from the rulers that are driving us into the ground. And so it's great to see that the 17th poll in a row has now shown a clear majority of Scots in favour of independence and that we've got the numbers. But a referendum is still not in sight. And we haven't, like uh, Denise said, we haven't really got a chance in hell of Boris agreeing to grant us one, knowing that he'll likely lose it and forever be held responsible for presiding over the breaking up of the British state. And in case we're in any doubt about this, George Osborne bluntly laid it out in the standard this week. Um, he said of Scottish independence, so what's the plan? Simple, refuse to hold a referendum. It's the only sure way you won't lose one. And he added, uh, even more honestly, there's a risk that the Scottish government will hold its own plebiscite, but that won't be legal. Just ask the jailed Catalonian leaders how their illegal poll worked out. So the Tories are very clear on their strategy. They will refuse to grant a legal referendum and in, in any other event, they'll, they'll use heavy repression, just like the Spanish state did in Catalonia, to block us from getting it. So what's clear to me is that we're not going to get it through legal parliamentary means alone, not only through the courts. And at the end of the day, I think we have to be clear that the legal system, it wasn't designed and doesn't work in the interests of ordinary people. It serves the interests of those in power and the interests of the state. And history shows us that the British state doesn't respect justice. They've broken international law many times before in their illegal wars in the Middle East, and they were recently quite ready to break it over Brexit and Northern Ireland. Um, the British establishment are looking to Catalonia as an example, and I think that we have to do the same. We have to be ready to rise to the challenge. We have to, and for, for me, that means a mass movement, mass strikes, mass civil disobedience. It means channeling the huge anger and the huge hunger for independence that exists in Scotland and turning that into practical action, into demonstrations, occupations of public buildings, rebellions and strikes. We need to fight for a Scotland that puts people before profit, health before profit, that stands up for trans rights, women's rights against racism and war. And I really hope that the new member organisation that All London and Banner are launching could be a vehicle that can channel that anger into action. Because that's a real strategy that can make Scotland ungovernable. And if we do manage to make Scotland ungovernable, we can make it harder for the Tories to not allow independence than it is for them to grant it. I think the leadership of the SNP and all kinds of people will debate until the cows come home about whether we need a Section 30, a plebiscite, a Plan B, a majority in Holyrood, in Parliament or wherever. 
Um, those discussions and tactics will, of course, play a role. But for me, the fact is that any clever maneuvering from politicians and lawyers will only be successful if it's backed up by the weight and the unstoppable power of the masses of people, of working class people in Scotland, fighting for and demanding change. And so we need seconds, to change the, of the movement. I'll just leave it there for now. I'm finished. Okay, so next up uh, we have Tommy Sheridan. You need to unmute, Tommy. We can't hear you. You unmute. There you go. How's that? That better? Sorry, guys. Um, Technology is not my strong point. Can I just say from the outset, thanks very much for the invitation to take part in the panel discussion. I think the points already made by both Denise and Ruby have been very inspiring and very helpful. I don't think any of us come to tonight's discussion with a monopoly on wisdom or a monopoly on strategy. I think already we've heard that we need, if this was a golf bag we need a selection of clubs in in the bag um, what we've got unfortunately on the table is denise quite eloquently described as a golf bag with only one club in it and, and i think it's a putter uh, and it's not going to be very good in the driveway um, the idea that we continually hark on about a section 30 order and that boris johnson will eventually see the error of his ways and will waking up one day and realise that democracy should actually be respected in Scotland is, of course, a pile of pish. It's, it's just not going to happen. And we, therefore, need to develop strategies that are realistic, strategies that can mobilise people, as Ruby has suggested, but strategies that also prevail democratically and can be lent upon as far as elections are concerned. Right now, we have to recognise where we are. We have had four national election victories for the Party of Independence. We've had two parliamentary votes in the Scottish Parliament for NDRF2. And we now have not 17, as Ruby suggested, there. there's now been 19. 19 successive opinion polls supporting independence. 78% of young people supporting Independence is, is entirely unprecedented. 19 successive opinion polls. The, the, the momentum is clearly with the independence movement. I would like to see us, and I'm open to persuasion about other ways as well, because, as I said earlier, no monopoly in wisdom, no monopoly in strategy. But personally, what I think is we've got an election coming up in May, an election that's taking place in the midst of a COVID pandemic, where hundreds of thousands of people's lives have been thrown into turmoil, where people are living in more and more uncertainty every single day. And unfortunately, many people are prematurely dying and our key workers and our health workers and our carers are under a huge amount of stress. But there's been elections in other countries that have taken place. Something like 40 countries have still held elections despite the pandemic. So I don't see why Scotland shouldn't have its election in May. I think that election has to become the independence election. And we have to appeal to all of the independence movement to use that election as the independence election. Now, as it stands, and some people, I'm a socialist, and some people disagree with me as a socialist calling for a vote for the SNP, and that's fine, you're entitled to your view on that. As far as I'm concerned, the SNP is the biggest de facto independence party. I would call for a first vote for the SNP, in May, 
as a blow for independence, as a strike for independence. And I would then say that the second vote has to be for independence, not for the SNP, because it's a wasted vote that's given to the SNP. That's the 30 seconds, Tommy. You give them your second vote, then you're electing unionists. I would rather see us as a movement use the second vote for alternative independent supporting parties and actually elect an opposition in May that is an independence opposition, not a unionist opposition. I think that's a strategy that we should fight for and develop in the coming weeks and months. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tommy. That was great. Um, so last up, we've got Angus McNeil. You there, Angus? Maybe you get four minutes here. Yeah, here I am. It looks like I'm unmuted now. Uh, Fisk or Magath? Um, yeah, I think Tommy and those uh, before me are uh, quite right. Nobody's got a monopoly in any of this at all, a monopoly in wisdom. Uh, but we need, uh, one of the things we do need to get is uh, the people have a monopoly. Uh, we need to get the okay from the people before we can do anything. And the thing that we're vexed with now is a mechanism to do that. Now, nobody in the Scottish government seriously believes uh, that the UK government's going to respect Scottish democracy and give us a Section 30 uh, and the independence referendum. That much is pretty clear. They may not have said so in the airwaves, but that's what they believe behind closed doors anyway. And nobody else in the Scottish Government can guarantee any sort of referendum whatsoever in the next uh, Scottish parliamentary term uh, between 2021 and 2026. And let that sink in a bit. No referendum can be guaranteed in the next five years, uh, no matter how you vote in Scotland, uh, because there's no way, as George Osborne was hinting to Boris, that he's going to um, uh, imperil himself or give himself an uncomfortable night in Downing Street. Uh, and I think we must move on rapidly ourselves on the mindset that the only valid ballot boxes for independence are those at a referendum. Uh, if you're a Democrat, uh, ballot boxes are valid in whatever situation they're in, be that an election or be that a referendum. And we must demand that from, uh, from others and demand it from ourselves and those on our side too. The ballot boxes must be respected when the spe people speak. And it's clear Scotland's ready to vote for independence uh, between the Brexit debacle and everything else. Um, Anybody, uh, and we've seen the 19 polls in a row, as Tommy said, 19 in a row, shown support in the high 50s. And that indicates an opportunity to get moving and to make sure uh, things uh, will happen. As I said, we've had, got to find a mechanism. Uh, it's not going to happen in the next Scottish parliamentary term. I repeat that so that people <laughs> get this. Uh, I hope uh, Martin Keatings is, will win, but what he's really doing is testing the power of the parliament. And I don't think the, that power is there. It'd be nice if it is, and uh, Aidan O'Neill asked Lady Cosgrove today to make a decision on that. So we know if the power is there or not in the Parliament, but it probably isn't. So we need to have our plan uh, ready uh, for the next while. And I think those of us who support a plan B and support the elections would actually prefer it to be a referendum, just for the simple reason that's what so many people have thought about for so long, and it's hard to change the habits of thinking. Uh, but the reality is it ain't going to happen, so let's have our plan B. And if it is going to happen, let's establish it happens before the 31st of March, say, uh, so that we don't find ourselves establishing afterwards it can't happen, and then have to wait for the next ballot box event, which will be 2026. So the only legal and guaranteed ballot box event that's going to happen in Scotland in the next while is the election in May. We can't get a, a majority at Westminster. We can at Holyrood and those Holyrood elections. And we, we should actually do in the 31st of March uh, a big stick uh, with, uh, with to Boris. Might, he might even yield the Section 30 rather than have the elections. Who knows? Uh, but as Tommy said, you need more than one club in the bag. Um, and I think I think a bit, of a, a bit of brinkmanship with him is no harm. Now, the other thing we've got to understand is there's a difference for Boris saying no to a re referendum request and Boris saying no to the answer from the people. The plan A is basically to ask the people, can we ask Boris, to come back and ask the people, do you want independence? And of course, with Boris at the centre of that, he will use his veto. Uh, plan B cuts to the chase, asks the people on the 6th of May, do you want independence or do you not want independence? And I think that is what we should be aiming at fire right now. We should be looking uh, to do that in the next, in the next uh, wee while. And there's nothing to be lost for the SNP here. Independence is more popular than the SNP. So if things go badly, the SNP are just going to be the biggest party. And if things go very well, uh, the prize is Scottish independence. And we started from May. And that is the end of uh, Rishi Sunak, Rishi Sunak uh, Boris Johnson and all the other nonsense of the austerity Tories uh, that have been infecting and blighting lives in Scotland 
for far too long. 30 uh, seconds, so, Angus. Basically, that is essentially the pitch I've got is uh, plan B, uh, be prepared to use the election, give the referendum options, whether it's a section 30 of the Scottish Parliament one, it's chance to establish itself before the 31st of May, uh, 31st of March. If that doesn't happen, then the ballot boxes, the legal and internationally recognised ballot boxes at the election in May should be used for independence. Thanks, Neil. Right, so first question, let's bring in, start bringing in some people from Zoom. Uh, let's see what we got here. Susanna, actually, can you do this one, please? Thank you. You're not on mute? Oh, there you are. Thank you. Uh, just to remind everybody, if you want to ask a question directly yourself to the panellists, can you please raise your hand virtually? There's a button at the bottom that says reactions. And if you click on that, there's an actual tab in there that says raise hand. And also, can you type your questions into the chat box at the side too? That'd be fantastic. So I've got a question here from social media first, actually, that I, I thought was quite interesting that I thought we would bring in. And it was Marlo asked if, what are the panellists' opinion on the May election being made into a plebiscite? So if we could start with Ruby first. I think that that would be a positive thing. I think that the sooner we get to vote on independence, the better. Um, but yeah, I think, like I said before, I do think that we have to look to uh, what happened uh, around Catalonia when they had a plebiscite um, and um, the repression that they faced. And I think we need to be ready to back that up with a, with a mass movement. And that, I think that needs to involve... Uh, really powerful forces like the trade unions and um, young people out on the streets uh, strikes and um, because you know their leaders were imprisoned and uh, we can't look to uh, necessarily look to the EU as a savior for us because um, when that happened um, in Spain and Catalonia the, the, the European Commission said um, this is an internal matter for Spain and they didn't intervene. So we need to be like, as the people here, we need to be ready to um, have the social weight to back that up. And I think that means building the movement now um, to be ready for that eventuality. Um, but I definitely think, um, yeah, that like Tommy said, this is an unprecedented situation in terms of support. Um, and the, the, the sooner that that can be turned into um, a, a move towards independence or Indy Ref 2 or a plebiscite, the better. Tommy, you want to come in? There you go. Um, yep, thanks very much for the question. It was a Mar Marlow, I think. Um, uh, Ruby's already uh, addressed some of the points. I, I think historical comparisons are always helpful, but they're not always exact. I, I do think when we discuss Scotland and we mentioned Catalonia and Spain, it would be remiss of us not to remember Spain's fascist history and the military dictatorship traditions, um, which uh, are not present in, in the UK. And I would also say that I don't think Scotland is Catalonia. I, I do think that we would be able to organise um, a democratic resistance that would be much more recognised worldwide than unfortunately Catalonia's was. Catalonia was abandoned disgracefully by the European Union. I don't think the European Union will run to Boris Johnson's aid any time soon. I think what Boris Johnson and his gang of thieves have done is they have built up British chauvinism, British nationalism to the extent that they are more or less despised across much of Europe now. So this isn't a, a popular a coup that they would be having against us if they tried to crush us for having a democratic referendum. We, the other comparison, of course, is with Sinn Féin in, in Ireland in 1918 when they made their election a plebiscite. Now, the only problem was 
is they never went from victory in the election directly to an independent republic. They had to have a civil war uh, in order to get that republic. However, they did make that the plebiscite. I think we have a situation here in May where we either, and as I say, I'm open to persuasion, we either say that your vote for independence in May is as for us to declare, if we get a parliament majority, declare independence, that's one option, or without fear or favour, we say that a parliamentary majority elected in May results in a referendum that we will call regardless of Westminster, we'll tell them about it, we'll give them, we'll be polite, we'll tell them when we're holding it, but no permission is sought because no permission is necessary. We call it in September at the latest, and we have that independence referendum on the back of having elected a majority independent supporting parliament. So, but there's two options, and, and I'm happy with either of them, uh, as I said right at the start, it's, you know, we've got two years in one mouth. Sometimes we have to listen more than we speak. Uh, and I'm willing to listen to all our arguments. Um, but I think those are a couple of strategies and a couple of routes that would get us to where we all want to go. Thanks very much, Tommy. That's fantastic. Denise, can we bring you in now? Yeah, so there's this number of advantages about using me as a plebiscite for independence. Firstly, it used to be the SNP policy, I think, to 2001, that a majority of SNP MPs elected was a majority for independence. So it's quite historic and is acceptable in a de your democratic group. The unionists couldn't boycott it because they wouldn't want to lose their parliamentary seats. So that has another advantage. The problem I see is, is there's no obvious way to get a plebiscite into the SNP manifesto because it doesn't really matter what SNP members say. At the end, it's Keith Brown, the deputy leader, that writes the manifesto. And he writes the manifesto and, he, and it's only a few weeks before the May election that we will know what's in it. So we won't know until then even what our independence policy is, whether we're still asking Boris for the Section 30. And so I do think it's a good idea, but I don't know how it can be actioned. But I think Angus might have some ideas about how to action it. Yeah, that was like, on that note, I think we'll bring in Angus. <laughs> no, point in, no point in me stealing his thunder, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, there's a, um, you know, the question was, should we go for a plebiscite in May? Yeah, if, if the all avenues to referendums are closed uh, by the 31st of March, let's, let's go for that. Um, and let's not find out afterwards that we can go uh, for uh, the uh, referendums, uh, that we can't go for the referendums. But Denise is absolutely right. You know, it's got to be in the SNP manifesto. We can't have, some people say, play your cards close to the chest. Well, you can't get a mandate for a secret. Uh, you're going to have to be blooming and honest with people and say, this is what we want to do. You can't say afterwards, oh, actually, we meant, if you voted for us, I meant we're sending rockets to the moon or we're, we're saying that this is for independence for uh, Greenland or whatever. No, you'd have to tell people, stay, stay up, this is for independence for Scotland, the, the majority of seats. And you'd hope that other parties who are of a similar mind for independence would, would do the same. Uh, so that when you'd have the vote in the parliament, you had the mandate to carry it and people would respect the ballot box. You know, um, <laughs> Boris Johnson, some fear, would say no. I don't think he will say no. Uh, he put himself in the same place as Donald Trump, and we saw how it went for Donald Trump when he tried to refuse or to reject or to, to sort of renounce the words of the ballot box. It didn't go very well for him at all. Um, one thing I would say is the Catalan situation is very different, and I always hesitate to mention it in the Scottish context. Uh, one story I will tell you is I took a guy, Alfred Bosch, one time, who was in the Cortes in Madrid, into the House of Commons, uh, and he was utterly amazed that I spoke socially uh, and seemed to be quite friendly with the Labour politicians, liberal, polit uh, liberal politicians and conservative politicians. Uh, he said in, Ma in Madrid they didn't have that sort of relationship at all. Now, I do know that if the Scots were to uh, vote for independence and just say Boris was to reject the will of five million people, if he had the temerity to do that and 
wanted to put himself in the bracket of Lukashenko. There are people running about in the House of Commons that wouldn't tolerate that at all. But the problem we've got in the SNP is some of us go, oh, it can't happen, he'll just say no, and we don't try. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But what we've got to do is put Boris into that position uh, of the Scottish people saying yes. I said, you know, if we ask them, do you want independence? There's 19 opinion polls. Do you think whatever, 1.8, 2 million people are going to turn around and say, no, I'm not one independence. See, unless you have a referendum, I'm now against independence. You know, you, you're, if you want your online shopping, you don't really care who's coming to the door with it, Hermes, post office or whoever, uh, Royal Mail, you'll take it. Uh, and it's the same way with independence as well. We want to create a ballot box event uh, where people can vote for independence, and that has to be, and that has to be in May, uh, given the way that referendums are uncertain. Now the question is, how do we pressurise that? And how do we get that on the manifesto? I think a start is this weekend at national assembly. Another start is a Scott goes pop poll that shows now uh, those opposing that are against not just the will of the SNP members, but against the will of the Scottish people. Uh, as we appear in opinion polls. And so they've got to realise they're out of step. They can no longer tell us that people won't fool this, they won't accept this, uh, and some are afraid that they might lose votes at an election for it. But the, and the, the, the fundamental point they've got to remember is the support for independence is greater than support for the SNP. And people who want something will take it the way it's offered to them first. And, you know, if we don't do it in 2021, the 2026 election, to, para to paraphrase... Seamus Marlon, the 2026 election is going to become the 2021 election for slow learners. And we in Scotland don't want to waste five more years uh, under Tory rule. Uh, and you're right, uh, in some ways, the ballot boxes at the referendums might well be blocked by the Tories. It'd be bad if we were blocking the ballot boxes at elections as a Scottish National Party. So hopefully wiser council will prevail in the next three to four months. Yeah, that's great, Angus. So I'm um, going to bring in a couple of Zoom contributions now. So there's lots of people with their hands up. So we'll firstly go to Roy Mackey and then to Charlie in Glasgow. So if you can just uh, keep it within about a minute, that would be great. So we can get through as many people as possible. On you go, Roy. OK. Um, well, actually, Denise preempted the question that I was going to ask, but then the conversation went on for there and Angus covered a few uh, other points. Um, so uh, I'm interested in the, the timeline then. When do, when is the last point at which we could persuade the SNP leadership to put this on the manifesto? And I I would ask that we consider. Um, Ruby talked about um, you know doing other things. I I think there'll be a time very soon that we maybe need to go and demonstrate outside SNP headquarters, peacefully, of course, um, but to let them know the strength of feeling, um, you know, that, that, that most of us, I think, feel that this needs to happen. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it. Thanks, Roy. And next up, Charlie, please, if you want to unmute yourself. Can you hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, Neil. Um, just very quickly, um, when I think back to the, the 2014 Indy campaign and those wonderful all-under-one banner demos that we've had since, what strikes you about them is the breadth and the diversity of them, you know, packed with thousands of trade unionists, trade unionists uh, anti-racists, um, anti-war activists, and so on and so forth, community activists, the law. In other words, it went way beyond the SNP, Yes, the largest, the most dominant group, but went way beyond them. Hence, that's our strength. That is how we win, by mobilising all these people and all these different groups. Now, my frustration is that the SNP leadership seemed determined to control all aspects of the timing and the route towards independence. And the worry is that they've made it clear that they favour legal and constitutional means only um, when Boris inevitably says no to a Section 30 order. Therefore, I'm actually quite excited about the, the launch of the new membership organisation when that happens more under one banner. And I think particularly if it's going to have more of a radical edge, that will be a huge boost and fill up to the organisation. Because if Boris and company continue to ignore the democratic will, the settled will of the majority of people of Scotland, then we have a right to um, use tactics up to and including civil disobedience. And this recent history shows us that's the right way to proceed. 
and it can be effective. For example, the anti-poll tax campaign. And for many years, we've had civil disobedience, non-violent direct action successfully used at the, the CND protests at Fast Lane. So quite excited about the new organisation because I feel that we'll need to be very um, open and inclusive about the tactics that we actually use going forward. That was great, Charlie. Thanks. So a couple of uh, great uh, contributions there. And, and I think the main theme is how does the Yes movement um, get the SNP leadership to, to change strategy? How do we do it? And what's the timescales on that? So first of all, over to Denise. So I think it will be very difficult because they're riding high in the polls. And I'm sorry, Angus, but politicians, if they're ahead in the polls, they don't want to do anything that will risk it. The problem really is that they're the party of government and they want to win in government. So they're risk averse. They've got high poll ratings, so they're risk averse. I would say I would be, as I said earlier, I think, I think I'd be very, very surprised if I seen anything other than some warm words about legal legitimate roots. But one thing I will say about that, there is no real illegal route to independence. A route to independence is first establish that people support independence, your country supports independence, then declare independence. The country that you're leaving may agree or may disagree, but you declare independence. Then you invite other countries to recognize you. If the country, if you get a country to recognize you, then that's great. You're independent. You're in the club now. So the idea that there's an illegal route is just nonsense. And that's another word we have to stop. We have to stop with the legal legitimate. A section 30 is no more legal and legitimate than any other route to independence that many, many countries have trod. We're just use, we're using the wrong terms here. We, every route to independence is a legitimate route to independence. <laughs> So on that, how we get SMP to pay attention, I think it, the only way you can do it is to threaten them with, at the ballot box. They're politicians. The only thing they care about. Sorry, Angus. <laughs> Angus accepted. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing they really care about is making sure they're elected again. So we do actually have a period of maximum um, you know, influence on the politicians because they're coming up for an election. So we could potentially ask the MSPs to pressurise. It's a long shot, but it's possible. So we could say to them, unless you're willing to stand up and say a vote for you is a vote for independence, we won't vote for you. And we can see how the MSPs react. But I think that that would be my first port of call, threaten them at the ballot box. It's the only thing that works with politicians. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Denise. And uh, the same uh, questions to, to Tommy Sheridan, please, on, if you want to. Yeah, you're fine, Tommy. You're unmuted. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, can, I, can, you, sorry, can you hear me? I was looking for the wee unmute button there. Um, sorry. I think Denise has made a very important point, and that is about pressurising the politicians. I think the one weakness is this. Angus, I think, is realistic, to realistic enough to accept that the SNP is not going to fight the May elections on a manifesto that says a vote for us is a vote to declare independence. I wish they would. I wish they would. I hope they'll fight the election on a manifesto commitment that a vote for us is a vote for Indy Ref 2, regardless of what Westminster says. I hope we can get at least that in. But here's a wee scenario, Neil, that I would like to suggest. And that is that we do use the elections. We take on board the point that Denise has made. The Scottish elections are unique. Why are they unique? Because you've got two votes. You don't have just one vote. You've got two votes. I don't know if you saw Ross, the wee Tory, Douglas Ross, recently the other day saying, appealing to the new leader of the Scottish Labour, will you enter an alliance with me to fight the nationalists? What is he doing? He's playing the game. He's trying to use the elections 
to try and use the voting system to maximise the unionist vote. They've been doing it for years. Why don't we do it? Imagine, Neil, for a moment, every one of those 19 polls has suggested the SNP is going to win over 50% of the vote. They are going to have 70, 70 of the first-past-the-post seats, 70 of the 73. They're going to have a majority on first-past-the-post alone. 953,000 people, 953,000, almost a million, gave their second vote to the SNP in 2016. How many MSPs did they deliver? Four. Four. Where from? Three of them were in the south of Scotland and one was Highlands and Islands. The other... The other six regions that voted overwhelmingly for SNP with a second vote got zero, zero MSPs. Imagine we could send an independent supporting a, a, a team into the parliament that becomes the official opposition, the official opposition. And they move as the first, uh, use the first opposition team to move an independence referendum bill. Put it on the table. What's the SNP majority going to do? Vote against that. That's our route to, de to demand and to guarantee that we actually have a referendum in 2021 and it undercuts and undermines the SNP's ability to manipulate the political scene because they're such a big beast in the political scene. They are the big independence party. No one wants to support any of the unionists, but... There is no alternative, but there is when you've got two votes. So my appeal is to those of us in the independence movement, if we can get our heads together and put forward a viable, credible alternative on the list, then we become the official opposition in the Scottish Parliament. That was great, Tommy. Thank you. Um, next up, Angus. How do you think, Angus, the Yes movement can pressurise the SNP to make sure that this manifesto is fit for purpose and strategies for independence. How, how can the Yes movement pressurise the party? See, that afternoon when they held the class for, for politicians, a very dodge questions. I wish I hadn't skipped that one because um, I'm going to have to answer this, Tommy. Um, I, you know, it's uh, <laughs> I think there are a number of things to do. I mean, I heard what Denise was saying there and she was, she was um, threatening them and using, using the stick, if I may say, uh, Denise, and, you know, I, I think the carrots have been maybe a misused metaphor in the, in, the, in the last week, and maybe rightly so. But I think, you know, telling these guys that you know, there are more votes to be got, independence is more popular than you. It, why have you got it into your head that you are afraid of uh, or against democracy for independence when it's an election? Why does it have to be a referendum? Where did this idea start? And similarly, where did the sort of idea start? Of legal, of a legal referendum. We can't hold a referendum in Scotland unless it's legal, because nobody's going to go and man the polling stations. Nobody's going to count the votes. Nobody's going to declare the result. Nobody's going to transport the ballot boxes from, say, Barra here uh, up to Stornoway to be counted. It ain't going to happen. It can't happen. So it's going to be legal. Uh, but I would say the most legal and the most uh, internationally recognised thing that any country does is elections, the elections. Um, and other thing that we use is the gold standard. Other, utter nonsense. We haven't, and they're going about the international community. This is on our own side. I haven't heard any of the international community I know. Uh, no ambassadors come up to me and said, you better get a section 30, or you better go for a gold standard. You don't even get that from the Westminster politicians saying you better get a gold standard or a section 30. Now they're just kind of thinking that you're going for independence or not. Uh, and they know when the ballot box speaks, the ballot box speaks. So let's give the people the chance at the ballot box. And I think we've just got to cajole and push and uh, uh, and encourage, not threaten, <laughs> encourage uh, them to see the, the, the right way. Now, a week's a long time in politics, and things are moving all the time uh, around us uh, in Scotland. But one thing I'll caution, because um, we're quite consensual here, I'm going to sort of maybe prod in Tommy's direction. He talks about getting, getting a, a, a referendum. Um, I think there's a very real chance, and do know that in the Scottish Government, they can't guarantee a referendum will happen. The Section 30 is going to be most certainly blocked for the reasons everybody understands and Boris definitely understands. As George Osborne said, you don't want an uncomfortable night in Downing Street. But the other route, the Scottish Parliament probably doesn't have the legal power to hold a referendum. Um, so, you know, unless there's two thirds of the Parliament uh, that are pro-independence and can crash it, and then afterwards, 
hold an election uh, on independence as we should do in 2021. We're going to be sitting around and waiting until 2026. Uh, so this is why I'm uh, doing the chat and doing, doing the articles and uh, doing the tweets uh, to try and get this into your heads. We've got a golden opportunity at the moment. I mean, I was elected first in 2005. And to imagine ourselves in this situation, 19 opinion polls. People used to phone you up and get dead excited if one opinion poll was over 30% for independence. We're irregularly in the high 50s. We've got an opportunity. It's here now. You know, the, the, the time for the harvest is now. Uh, and our lot are like, oh, I don't know. I mean, what would Boris say? Would Boris let us? It's not about him. It's about the 5 million Scottish people and stop putting him in the centre of it. And another point, I'll disagree with somebody who said, uh, you know, um, Boris... Boris ignoring the Scottish uh, people. Well, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. But if our ask is to ask the people to ask Boris, can we come back and ask the people? Now, if you're asking Boris, we're not dictating to Boris. We're treating Boris as we're treating the Scottish people, which is a mistake. But Boris has got an option in his answer, and his answer is going to be no, because he's a mug if he says yes uh, to the SNP Section 30 at the moment because we're riding so high in the polls. He ain't going to do it. As he's indicated, 2055 will be early enough for it to happen. And so we've got to take matters into our own hands. We've got to ask the people. And we can only do it with the say-so of the people. And the say-so of the people could come as early as May. But we've got to do it. And yes, uh, we've got to cajole, push, and email Keith Brown uh, and National Assembly this weekend for those that are at, it, uh, are at National Assembly on Sunday. I have to make sure that this is discussed um, and I thank the number of people I'm seeing in the comments there. Jimmy Ross and I saw Mr. McIntyre as well, is uh, su supportive of, of things too. Uh, so whoever else is going to the National Assembly, please help and try and get this discussed and see if we can move uh, the SNP uh, leadership around because there's any moment they could pivot. You know, the trade situation, you could pivot. The shellfish, you could say, right, that's enough. We're going for independence. There's a number of things you could draw a line in the sand that's going on almost weekly, daily, and make this election suddenly about... Uh, independence, but we've got to put a bit of um, bit of steel in the spines, perhaps uh, at SNP HQ. I've maybe said enough there. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That was great, Angus. So, so finally, Ruby, if you want to maybe answer that too, how how are we going to go about pressurising the SNP so that uh, the, you know the manifesto, so that the the strategy is is correct and it's not one that's going to leave Scotland stuffed. Thanks. Um, I think that the independence movement needs to needs to be independent of the SNP. I think that what All Under One Banner has done is fantastic of getting hundreds of thousands of people out onto the streets. And obviously we can't do that right now. We're in a pandemic. We need to do things online and do things socially distanced. But I think as soon as we can, that strategy of getting hundreds of people, thousands of people galvanised out on the streets and linking up with other movements. Um, I've been uh, an anti-racist activist and I look to the Black Lives Matter movement for inspiration. And um, just a tiny example of that is, you know, in Bristol, people were petitioning um, for years and years and years to get Ed uh, Colston's statue down. Um, and when the Black Lives Matter movement erupted and there was masses of people on the streets, they just simply pulled it down and put it in the sea. Um, another example of that is that how George Floyd's killers have now been convicted when they never would have been otherwise. Um, so instead of appealing to the SNP, we need to be breathing down their necks. We need the masses of people um, and, um, reaching out to the Black Lives Matter movement, reaching out to the climate movement, so involving young people in a way that's really active. That's not just about saying um, vote in the May elections, though, of course, we want um, a majority for independence in Hollywood. It's not just about saying go and vote. It's about saying let's take action that, that forces the SNP to move quicker. Um, and that, yeah, like like everybody said, it says that we're going to take this and not ask Boris for it. Um, and I think that's the strategy. Thanks very much, Ruby. Now, this time I'm going to bring in three questions. I'm going to bring in two from the Zoom panel. I'm going to bring in one from social media as well. So can I bring in Geraldine Houston and Scott Davis first, please? We'll start with Geraldine. You unmute yourself. Supposing we can um, persuade the SNP to make the May election a, a, a plebiscite, uh, as most people in here, I think, seem to be, to be hoping for. Um, what's to stop the Unionist parties like going for for tactical voting, if you like, and, and maybe withdrawing candidates from various seats and sort of a uh, plowing all the no vote into one person or one party. And could that be a risk that if we say, right, okay, this is actually our independence, um, this is our independence referendum or plebiscite, you know, could that be a risk that actually if they do that, 
it, that although the polls just now are looking really positive, it would change the ball game altogether and make it a wee bit more risky. Thanks very much, Geraldine. Can we bring in Scott now? Scott Davis, you unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, I'm, un I'm unmuted now. Um, sorry about the lighting. I, I didn't prepare uh, my, my living room before this. <laughs> um, it was just more, uh, it was in response to uh, uh, Ruby's proposal. Um, and I totally agree with a lot of it. Um, it strikes me a little bit similar to the Extinction Rebellion strategy a little bit. Um, and it did make me think, like, uh, we've cornered a lot of um, the left-wing progressive people uh, in the independence movement uh, or in Scotland. And I think uh, we also have to be reaching out to people from different sectors. You know, if you look at the fisheries industry at the moment, it's really prime for kind of uh, securing uh, their vote after a lot of them kind of went for, for Brexit. And, and, and now we can maybe get them onto the Scottish independence side. And also people who uh, rural people in rural areas like small local farmers and uh, crofters and, and and I spoke to a crofter recently in your Bewley, and and one of the one of the things that she said to me that stuck out was uh, watching like Extinction Rebellion and things like that. It was like watching a soap opera, and it didn't feel like they were kind of part of it. It, it kind of made it more distant in some ways as well. And I was wondering, uh, my long term strategy would be to kind of maybe have like land assemblies and, and kind of a local resource assemblies to get people more experienced with, with their own environments and also learning about the kind of cultural history. So if all, one, all under one banner were to tweet things regarding um, colonialism and things like that, then people actually have experience of being educated about Scottish colonial history before we ask them to, 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 to basically embrace that. So I think we do have to be radical in our strategy, um, but I think we have to do it in such a way that we're bringing people from different sides of the political spectrum onto this idea of Scotland, rather than speaking to purely kind of um, leftist progressives, because I think we have most of them. If we want to get above 60%, then we need to speak to fishermen, crofters, and get these guys and talk their language as well. So we need to be radical, but you know, I, I think we need to do it in a strategic way rather than just, you know, speaking to ourselves in some ways, I think, as well. Thanks very much, Scott. That was a really interesting one, that one. The other one I'm going to bring in is from social media, and it's from Mikey, who has asked, what can us, the people of Scotland, do as independent supporters to help the cause? So you've got three very interesting and quite different questions there. Um, will we bring in Tommy first? Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, right, you can hear me, right. Um, yeah, um, very good questions, all, all three of them. I think the point that Scott made about trying to appeal across the board is important, but I think we have to be clear that there's no way that we can answer every question before independence. Because my vision of independence may not be shared by certain people within the independence movement. My vision of independence is we, know, we have no royal family. My vision of independence is we have no NATO membership. My vision of independence is that we have publicly owned wind, wave, solar industry, oil and gas. I'm a socialist and, and I'm involved. And Scott's really that a lot of socialists are involved in the independence movement, but, but some socialists aren't. Some socialists are still supporting the, the Labour Party and, and, and other parties and don't support independence. So I think what we have to try and do is find the, the common denominator for us all, which is independence. All these other questions, for instance, membership of the European Union, do we go back into the European Union? Personally, I, I want a referendum on it. I, I want to, to, to discuss it. I'd prefer to do a Norway than to, to go back into the European Union. But other people in Scotland may disagree. That's fine. I don't mind as long as Scotland decides. What we all disagree with is that England has decided what happens as far as our membership of the EU is concerned. I think what we have to have is an approach which tries to tie all the ropes together 
We've got massive talents within the independence movement. If you think about it, all under one banner, hope over fear, forward is one. They're all grassroots organisations that haven't waited for somebody to tell them to organise rallies or demos since 2014. They've organised themselves. If you think of all the social media, all the blogs, all the indie bloggers, they, they don't get any mainstream uh, oxygen because the mainstream are predominantly, overwhelmingly unionist. They, they want to stop uh, the, the, the message for independence. But I do think we have to use every opportunity that arises. Uh, Pressurising the SNP is, 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 is uh, perhaps unfortunate, and I'm sure Angus has taken everything uh, in the right manner, that no one is trying to say that it's him personally that's responsible. But I do hope that he would accept that there are some within the SNP at the higher echelons of that party who, quite frankly, have become far too comfortable with the trappings of devolution. Devolution is working for them because they've got lovely incomes and they've got a lot of power and authority and uh, we've just to wait and wait and wait. One in four of our wains are in poverty. We've got over a million people in low pay. We've got our carers who don't even get a living wage. But we'll have to wait. Well, I'm sorry, I'm fed up waiting. Uh, and I think momentum is with us now. And my point about the Scottish Parliament voting for an independence majority is that the Scottish Parliament, if it votes for an independence majority, calls a referendum, calls a referendum and organises a referendum. It will be up to the unionists and others may boycott it. That may be the case. That's then up to us to get over 50% to participate and we then declare ourselves an independent country based on that referendum. If we're not going to get, which it looks unlikely, we're not going to get the SNP to turn the May election into a plebiscite on independence, then we make sure that the parliament at least calls in the ref uh, to within 2021. Let's strike while the iron's hot. Let's strike while these bastards in Westminster are so weak and divided. Don't let them recover. Don't let them get their act together because then they'll come back at us even stronger and try and as attack us with everything they've got. Let's strike while we're strong. And that's why 2021 is so important as far as I'm concerned. Thanks very much, Tommy. I think it's a good idea to bring Angus in to respond to that then. There was quite a lot said, <laughs> kind of aimed in your direction. So <laughs> I was just feeling for most of it, I should applaud. Uh, it, was, it was very good. Uh, I think Tommy's absolutely right. And it's a very mature point to make, actually, that, you know, what's Scotland going to be like after independence? Well, nobody in Iceland can say what Iceland's going to be like in the next few, few years, next three to four to five years. Similarly in Ireland, similarly in Norway, similarly in Denmark. The future is something we decide kind of collectively together. And we're pushing forward. And indeed, Tommy might want one thing and I might want another thing. Uh, but we both agree that, you know, we move forward on the basis that's what the majority of Scotland want and not the majority of the Tories that we don't elect in Scotland. So that, that's, that's the point of, of our independence and we ca why we can't uh, set it uh, in concrete in any way. There's a number of good, of good questions. And I'll come back to some of the points Tommy made at the end. But Geraldine asked uh, an interesting point about... What would the unionists uh, maybe unite against us and um, uh, and set up uh, just uh, one party uh, to stand against the SNP? There's two two answers to that probably, or two stages to that. That's fraught with risk for them, uh, because if you're a diehard Labour voter or a diehard Tory voter, and you're only presented <laughs> with a Labour or Tory candidate, you've got two options, maybe three options. Okay, you hold your nose, you vote for them, uh, you abstain. Uh, which is no good for them, or you just get so fed up that the fact that they're gaming the system, you might go and vote for the SNP. Um, and so that's, that's a risk for them <coughs> to, to go and do that. But the, the biggest answer is numbers. We've got the numbers this time. Uh, and ultimately, when it comes to a referendum, that's going to be the situation anyway. It's going to be idea one versus idea two, and we'll move forward on the basis of, uh, or not. Uh, but as we did in 2014, we'll all respect the outcome of the referendum because we respect ballot boxes in Scotland. And that's why I want us to respect the ballot boxes in May and put the question to the people in May. Uh, but, you know, I think we've got the numbers and we can be quite confident with having the numbers. And again, I'll reiterate, uh, I would think that would only be a risk if the SNP support was greater than the support for independence. The support for independence is ahead of the SNP support. So I think they can only gather uh, momentum while... Uh, maybe putting the others in, in, a, in a difficult uh, position. Uh, to Scott, uh, we said talking to Crofters, well, I was feeding the sheep a couple of hours ago, Scott, so you're talking to one uh, this 
this evening. Um, and you know, but I, I get some of your wider points as well. Uh, it was uh, it was Mickey. Was it Mikey who asked to who to help the cause <clears throat> at the moment? You know, some people will say that it's too late, and I do know that some of the Scottish government will say it's too late to change tack. A year ago, it was too early. We're scared of the horses. There was some excuse not to do something for some of them. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we've just got to keep going with the power of argument and reason argument. And as Tommy said, they're a, dis they're a disarray in Westminster. Uh, you know, they're still, they're still talking the Kool-Aid of we've taken back control of our money, our laws, and whatever else that they think they've taken control of. Meanwhile, across the English Channel, the exports are down 40%. The traffic across from Holyhead is down 50%. The Irish are sailing boats round England to, now to get to uh, and to get to the markets in in, in Europe. Uh, so there are a moment of, of maximum weakness, and we've had 19 polls, and we're hesitating about using the 2021 election while we know that a no referendum can be guaranteed. And this is this is inside Scottish government. They know they cannot guarantee a referendum in the next parliamentary term. So no one in the SNP can guarantee you a referendum. They can't guarantee this in the next five years. So. It's either 2021, folks, or 2026. And as Tommy cautions, in 2026, uh, they might be a little more organised than they are at the moment. Uh, we should strike definitely when the iron's hot. The iron is extremely hot now. Thanks, Angus. Ruby, can we bring you in? Because Scott kind of directed his question and directly to you. So uh, do you have an answer for Scott about reaching out to different groups? Thanks. Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting question from Scott. Um, well, I would say uh, Tommy says he's a socialist. I'm a socialist too, and I want a socialist Scotland. And I think now's not the time. Um, I think he's, Scott's absolutely right. We need to be reaching out to new layers of people. But I don't think that that's by making compromises. Um, I think the system has absolutely failed people up and down Scotland from all different walks of life. Now more than ever, I think that's clear to everyone. The system has failed people. So opposing the status quo isn't going to alienate people. I think that people aren't going to be motivated to get involved and join the movement if we're not offering something new and something radical. In, if you look back to 2014 um, and the amazing movement um, that that was on the streets then and also the times when support for independence was the highest it's when the hope for real change was offered um, and that means that we don't just say independence for independence sake we we have to offer a real vision of something to you and that means like the kind of things that tommy mentioned like not being in NATO, not supporting wars, um, redistributing wealth and land so that um, we have a society for the many and not the few. And I think that's the way that we motivate new people to get involved, not just by saying common denominator, only talk about independence, because it needs to mean something to people that are disillusioned and that have been failed by the system. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's by, by asking for radical change that we, that we motivate people that have been downtrodden to get involved in the movement. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. I've got more, but I forgot. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ruby. Denise, I thought I would maybe bring you in with um, Geraldine's about the tactical voting, because as many people are quite aware, you instigated some tactical voting yourself um, for the, the SNP conference for the NEC. So I thought this might be something you'd be quite interested in talking about. Um, well, yeah. Uh, as far as what Geraldine has uh, said, it would mean that the parties would have to stand on the same manifesto. So you might think, yeah, OK, that's fine for Labour and Tory. They can have the same manifesto. We can't tell the difference. But I think Labour and Tory would have a different idea about it. So I can see that Labour, Tory and the Lib Dems would be able to stand on the same manifesto. But also it is pointless because we do have a PR system for the Scottish Parliament. So... If they, they, they don't stand on the same manifesto as the one party. But what they do do in the constituencies, as we know, they stand down in favour of each other. So what that means is their candidate is a paper candidate. They spend mo no money, they do no campaigning, they don't do anything. And we saw in 2017 that they absolutely made the rod for their own back because the Labour candidates stood down in the Tory constituencies. And that 13, those 13 Tory MPs gave May her majority. We would have actually had a Corbyn government in 2017 if the Labour Party hadn't stand down in, in, in favour of the Tories. So, yes, they will do that. They will do their own tactical voting, not joining together and having a manifesto, but they will tactically uh, vote mm -hmm. and 
Labour people vote for Tories. When you look at transfers in council elections, you will see when the Labour candidate goes out, the vote on the to- goes to the Tories, the second vote. Similarly, when the co- Tory candidate goes out, the second votes go to the Labour. So they're already, and Lib Dem and Tories are basically indistinguishable. So they are basically already doing it. So actually, we should get smarter on the tactical voting and using the de system the way that the, the other parties, the unionist parties do. So that's regarding the, the fact that they join up. As long as we have more than 50 percent, we'll win. So we have more than 50 percent, we'll win. They can do what they like. They won't beat us. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a final. On the matter of the, the disobedience and, and things, that could come. But we haven't even tried the democratic route yet. I don't think we're there. We have given the SMB, sorry, Angus, many, many mandates to hold an independence referendum. And to be frank, they haven't tried to. It's not, I mean, writing a letter and saying, can I have a section 30, please, is not trying. But, you know, they could have passed an actual date of a referendum bill if they wanted and, and challenged. Westminster to do something. So we don't know that Westminster won't respect the Scottish Parliament. We don't know that Westminster won't respect a vote of the Scottish Parliament because we haven't actually put that to the test. So let's do that first. Let's get a democratic mandate. Let's get the will of the people to independence. Then we can go and speak to Boris Johnson or whoever's in power And we've got behind us that mandate. We say, we've got a mandate for independence. What what do you do about it now? So that's that's what I think about that side of it. (laughs) And I think, was there there another question as well? And and I suppose on the matter of the Dijon voting, I think this is really important that we could, we can, I think Tommy brought it up that the SNP don't have an opposition. And I really think that's a pity. I don't think this is just about maximizing pro-Indy MSPs. I would really like to see Nicola Sturgeon questioned every Thursday on her progress to independence, how far she's getting us. I would like to see a a party that is to the, is more, is stronger, braver, more into independence, than the SMP, not as managerial, uh, in the Scottish Parliament, keeping the SMP honest. Maybe if we had a party keeping them honest, they wouldn't be able to break manifesto pledges. Sorry, Angus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Denise. I would say, um, <laughs> certainly, you're, you know, you're, you're totally correct about we haven't put this to test yet. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, the, the, the SNP are going along with this voluntary strategy. Um, it's totally voluntary. Nobody's asking it to happen. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's of our own accord. So, yes, let's put that to the test. I agree with that. <laughs> so let's bring in, we've got a couple of Zoom contributions now. Um, I believe we've got Colin Jackson, if he's there. By, by, by the way, there's only so many boots in the backside that I can... That I can uh, <laughs> I can pull on an evening. <laughs> it's not, but it's, it's slippers. It's only, we're only wearing slippers. <laughs> <laughs> on, on you go, Colin. Yeah, I've just, I have just unmuted myself. That's a good start, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I sent, uh, I sent a photo shot of a petition I'd seen on Twitter. I sent it to you, Neil. I don't know whether you'd seen it or not. I don't think you must have done. Because I, the, my, my silly idea was to send it to you so you'd know what I was talking about. You know, So what I'll do instead is I'll give you the gist of it. I've got it in front of me. There was a petition sent to Westminster um, uh, by uh, somebody. Uh, the, uh, it was headed, the Treaty of Union 1707 is no longer fit for purpose. Dissolve the Union. And they got the required number of votes uh, on, on the petition, sent it to Westminster. It was rejected. And this is what the rejection says. Uh, it's about something that the UK government or parliament is not responsible for. 
we, we can't accept your petition because this would be a decision for the people of Scotland and not the UK government or parliament. So, you know, what, you, what was it? By the way, thank, thank you to the panel. You are a Premier League panel. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. What does the panel think about that? Thanks, Colin. Um, one more just now as well. I think we've got Ewan with his hand up. If you want to come in, Ewan, unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're there, if you, you can hear us. Hello. Yes, thank you very much um, for letting me speak. And that's just what I say, I've got a lot of respect for quite a few of your panel members. Um, but Denise, you said uh, there is no illegal or illegitimate route to independence. Um, I just, I don't understand your thinking here, especially for, um, if you're thinking like South Ossetia, who declared independence, or even Catalonia. I, mean, I don't think the people in Catalonia would agree with you when they were being beaten up at the polling stations, when the Spanish did not agree to their, their independence referendum. It's just, it's not true. It's not true at all. I, are you even suggesting that armed uprisings are legitimate form of ind getting independence and especially when you have a power as large as the United Kingdom against you it's not going to happen is it? Because no other country is going to recognise you without a legal state sanctioned referendum point is, and, and if you're talking about gaming the Dahon system, what the unionists are going to say is well look how they're cheating they're, they're cheating their way to independence so why should we grant it to them? Okay, thanks, you. And um, we'll go to you, Denise, first, yeah, if you want okay. to answer that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think actually you will find that every country that has become independent has become independent legally. It's been legal. International law is, hasn't got any hard and fast rules on this. If you ask if people have uprisings, yeah, America had an uprising. They had a declaration of independence. They had an uprising. People do have uprisings to get independent. So, you know, there's a lot of different routes to independence and countries get there one way or another and now they're independent. America's independent, so it's the other countries. Now, obviously, there is some cases where it, it doesn't prove, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, you know, exceptions prove the rule. So there is some particular issues like I think Bosnia is still not properly recognized. So not every country who tries to be independent actually becomes independent. But once you're independent, you're legally independent. So every, every single in, independent country in the world is legally independent. And they got there by a very, very many different routes. Sometimes the National Assembly, where they just call everybody together. I think that's Latvia and places like that the former Soviet states, many got there without the permission of the, 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 the people that owned them <laughs> or held them. Uh, Ireland is a very another very good example where they, they had a parliamentary majority. And to be honest, the British were in Ireland causing trouble for them for a great many years afterwards. So uh, there is many different ways but once you're independent, you're legally independent. And how you get to be legally independent is when other country in the club, some other nation recognizes you. The man, and I can't remember his name, he was prime minister of Iceland. And he went to, this story is probably completely wrong. I think it was Latvia, but it could have been somewhere else, a former Soviet state or Lithuania. And he walked into the parliament and he recognized them. And that was it. They were in. So once you're independent, you're legally independent. And the only way you need, only thing you need for legal independence is for another state in the club to say you're independent. And I have to argue with you, I don't think I use the word gain at any point. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> well, because it's not gaming the system. Mm -hmm. We have a Tory government, 40 odd percent. We had a Labour majority government with 37 or 35 percent so you use the system that you're given there's nothing to do with gaming it it's democracy and i certainly didn't use that word thanks denise uh, just to uh, tommy uh, if i can bring you in now tommy on the point of international recognition um as denise has highlighted there and how how important is that and 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 what is the difference between recognition and and permission in the sense of a, a legitimate route to independence I think that I think that Denise has very eloquently explained the position. Actually, we don't have 
a single route to independence. No um, country in the world has to go through a single route. Lots of countries have lifted the armour light and other countries have lifted a lead pencil. Uh, other countries have uh, had demonstrations of, of millions that, and, and declared independence and, and other countries have had elections. Uh, the, the, the two examples that were, were, were given in relation to Sinn Féin 1918, they, they won an election and declared for the Irish Republic. The fact that then resulted in a, a, a war of independence for four years to 1922 um, oh, is a matter of history. In fact, what the recent Martin Keaton's court case has clarified, which I think is quite instructive, is that the idea that the British Union, because we keep hearing, oh, it's the most successful union in the world, it's over 300 years old. In actual fact, it was only formed in 1922, the current British Union, because when Ireland left, then the arrangement changed. So the British Union is only as old as 1922. And what we have to keep reminding ourselves is, although none of us were around, in 1707, there was a voluntary union entered into, a voluntary union. Now, the idea that some 300 years later, we can't arrange for the withdrawal from that voluntary union is patently ridiculous. There is more than one way to do it. Um, Craig Murray often makes the point, uh, former ambassador for Uzbekistan for the UK, um, that gaining international recognition uh, is not about whether Westminster gives you permission or not. In fact, if you think about it, if you think about the countries across the world that have been oppressed by bigger nations. The idea that you would seek permission from the big country to leave it is just rubbish because they would, they would never give you that permission. And what we have to always, I think, uh, bear in mind here is that we ha currently have a democratic result. Now, some people will argue about it was biased, and I would certainly support that in terms of the BBC, etc. But there was a result in 2014 which we lost. Unfortunately, we lost that. That's why I'm not in favour of us declaring independence without having another clear plebiscite. There needs to be a clear general election, or in my opinion, the Scottish Parliament gives notice, after winning a majority in May, they give notice that they are calling a referendum. Now, if Westminster refuses to accept that, that's up to them. We then go to every country in Europe. We go across the world. And we say, we've held a democratic referendum as part of the Scottish Parliament because the people of Scotland voted for these people. And we've held a referendum. By the way, we need to win it. We can't have a referendum of any nature and not win it. We have to win that referendum. I'm confident we can win it because we'll have hope on our side, whereas they've only got fear on their side. So I think that Denise has answered the, the, the question that she, when she talks and when the mention of a legal or illegal the point is, once you're independent, it doesn't matter how you got there, you become a legally recognised nation. And very, very quickly, Neil, on the, the point about the use of the voting system, let's be clear about this right from the outset. The Dahon voting system that was foisted upon the Scottish Parliament was a unionist choice. It was a ruse from the unionists to prevent there ever being a majority for independence. That's just fact. That's what they did when they drew up. The architects of the Scottish Parliament were worried about a future independence majority. So what they said is, well, let's have a parliament that doesn't have just first past the post. Let's have some PR in it. And that will make sure that there's always coalition government and the coalition governments will always be governments of a unionist variety. And of course, for the first five, uh, four or five elections, that's what happened. What happened in 2007, and then particularly in 2011, wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't in the script that the SNP would actually win an overall uh, majority. So in terms of playing the voting system, we're not playing the voting system, we're utilising the voting system we're utilising the system that the unionists devised. The fact that it's now being used against them is their fault, not our fault. 
Thank you, Tommy. That was excellent. Um, I'll, let's go to, to Ruby now on um, what's legal, what's legitimate, on, on international recognition, on roots to independence, uh, following on from the question there. Thanks. Yeah, so um, Denise spoke about uh, the strategy of mass um, disobedience and, and rightly made the point that, you know, we haven't actually had the chance to have to go through the legal route yet with the referendum. But I think that the strategy of mass action and mass disobedience can also be a way of forcing the SNP because the masses of people are streets ahead of the SNP right now. And we can't just tell people to sit sit at home and, and wait for the SNP. Like, I think a lot of people on the panel agree with that. And I think that the, the, the strategy of mass action can be part of the way that we force the SNP to act because the people are way ahead of them and they're on the streets saying, we need to do something right now. Um, one of the contributors made the point about uh, what's legitimate and what's, and what's not legitimate and used the example of, of Catalonia. Now, I think that just because they face repression doesn't in any way uh, say that what they did was not legitimate. Um, but it, it did show that you need a mass movement if you're going to back up um, a different avenue towards um, towards independence. Um, on, on the point about, uh, and I think, I think as well that it would be, although people have made the point that um, obviously Catalonia and Scotland are not the same, the British state and the Spanish state are not the same, but I think it would be naive to assume that there will be no repression from the British state. Um, there's countless examples that I could bring up. I mean, Ireland, of course, um, but also um, protest movements and the way that they've been handled by the police. I think there's every indication that there could be repression, um, but the Scotland, I agree, is in a good, possession, good position to face that off and, and there would be an outcry from the international community, but that, that doesn't mean that we don't need um, mass action here to resist that repression. Um, in terms of um, the international community, like of course, um, and the recognition, um, yeah, you need recognition from the international community to be a nation. Um, but also, if we made Sc Scotland ungovernable, if um, workers refused to go to work, if the machine, the whole machine of the of the system in Scotland ground to a halt because we caused havoc, and we really made Scotland ungovernable, then we would actually be forcing the hand of the international community to recognise uh, Scotland as an independent nation. Um, and that's the role that we can all play. Thank you, Ruby. That was great. And lastly, to Angus, and I see in social media, there's talk over what's what's the better uh, strategy here? Is it a plebiscite or is it our own referendum? I mean, both of them have got renounced in Section 30 as the basis. Uh, that's the fundamental, really, for both of these these, these ways forward. So to, to put that to you on top of what was already asked. Well, I suppose the answer the, 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 the last point there on, on the referendum or the election, uh, you know, I can't say that one is better than the other. If this people speak in the ballot box, a, a referendum or an election, the people speaking as Democrats, we have to, re we have to uh, respect what the people say. And it's pretty simple. It's as simple as that, really. Uh, on the establishing of, uh, on, on the waste independence and recognition, what we've got to do is establish the legitimacy of the people's view. Now, we, I, we've, <laughs> this is why I'm saying the ballot boxes, because it doesn't matter if it's a referendum or, an, or a, an election. The, the legitimacy of the people, it's their legitimacy, everything else springs from that. We can't go declaring, oh, we'll wreck the union, or we'll sort of dissolve the union, or we'll do this, or we'll do that. We need the people, you know. Much as I would like to set up independence tomorrow, without the permission of the people, I can't do that. Um, and once we get that, all else will follow. Uh, in 2014, and I was from Iceland, they were the first lot to recognize the Baltic states. Uh, I don't think I asked much permission from Moscow either. Uh, and uh, they were ready to recognize Scotland. And we felt internally that for the, <clears throat> for the management of this and for good relations, it'd be nice if London was the first to recognize Scotland because we're gonna, they're going to be our number one friends and partners uh, after independence. At least that was a lot easier when we were in the European Union and we didn't have the mad Brexiteers in charge. But anyway, leaving that to one side, the reality still would be, as the Irish have, it's good relations uh, in these islands are very important. So that would have been one of the one of the things we would have done. And Tommy, I think it was Tommy said it absolutely right. Up to a couple of years ago, I used to say that the uh, the Hollywood actors Doris Day and Kirk Douglas were older than the United Kingdom. Uh, so when Prime Minister like John Major once went on about a thousand years of British history, and to an extent he was right, of course, because that's on a geographical term. Uh, when people say you want to end Britain, no, you can't. Uh, it's, that's the geographical entities. An island to the east of Barra here, uh, east of the Nihiling and Inir. Um, but the, he, he's conflating, as they often do, Britain with the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom is only dating you now from December 1922. That's the United Kingdom of Great Britain 
and Northern Ireland. So that's a, that's a good point that, uh, that Tommy uh, raised with us there. Um, but one thing I would like to, to bring to people's attention, the UK government has said it won't have a referendum and it says no to a referendum. The UK government has been studiously careful about doing it, is saying they will not, not recognise what the Scottish people say because the international reverberations of that from Beijing to everywhere else and to their standing, and if they're refusing the will of the people, there are so many knock-on effects. They're not the ones who are saying you can't be independent if you decide to be independent. They're saying you're not going to have a referendum. And as long as their policy is to ask them, can we have a referendum, you can see how easy it is for them to block Scotland. They're blocking Scotland because the only route we're choosing is the one that's directly uh, goes to them as the traffic lights or the signposts. We don't need to walk down that road of the Section 30 to, to Westminster. There are a number of other ways of establishing the legitimacy of the people. To me, Scotland has three choices. There, there's the referendum of the Section 30, the road's blocked. There's the referendum of the Scottish Parliament, the road's uncertain, and nobody can guarantee that one. Or there's the guaranteed legitimate event, the most legal event that, that we're going to have in, in democratic politics in Scotland for the foreseeable future, and that's the election in May. And we either take that or we gamble on the Scottish Parliament having a referendum, and if that gamble doesn't work, which it probably won't, we'll find out soon probably with Keatings, uh, we're then down to 2026. And as Tommy said earlier, if we wait that long, um, we, may f we, we may face a more organised uh, unit against Scottish independence in the way they were in 2014. The one thing they don't have with them this time is the EU's a members club. They won't have the likes of Jose Manuel Barroso from Portugal saying whatever David Cameron wanted him to say because he's looking for backing uh, to be in NATO. Uh, they don't have the allies they had. In fact, there is a lot who had sympathies with Scotland in the, in the, in the EU and the EU wider, the European economic area, who were a bit shy about saying it because they would be offending a member of their club. The UK is no longer in the club, so offending them is not such a big deal anymore. Again, as Tommy says, the iron's hot. Denise is hinting the same, Ruby's hinting the same. And Denise made a really good point as well, that we haven't ex exhausted the roots and let's get at them and let's move this along a little bit uh, because just assuming we can't do things when other people are telling you are not telling you this, it's been, we're, we're defeating ourselves in many ways. Uh, so let's just get going and let's push the envelope and see what happens. And we'll probably be uh, independent from, from June onwards <laughs> and all under one banner will be winding down. There'll be no need for them. <laughs> And I wouldn't, I wouldn't get my backside kicked again in a few, in a few months' time in another, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in another Zoom night about SNP <laughs> policy. Thanks, Angus. <laughs> I'm trying to put us all at a jobs here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point. That's what I'm trying to do at Westminster. I'm trying to put myself out of a job. You know? I, I would uh, quite like to put you out of a job as well, yeah. <laughs> If you're looking for an ambassador in Reykjavik or somewhere like that, I'll maybe, I'll maybe volunteer or maybe somewhere warmer. I don't know. I mean, if, if you're stuck, like, you know, but oh, well, we'll think with me afterwards, unemployed in Barra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. OK, right, I'm going to bring in, we're, we're kind of starting to run short of time now, so I'm just going to fire questions at you. So I'm going to bring in Bob from Glasgow and Donny Gluckstein. So can I bring in Bob first? Can you unmute, Bob? So me, yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, hi there. I just want to be a couple of couple of points. Uh, first of all, uh, with regard to this issue of tactical voting, uh, kind of worries me a little bit uh, because people are in the sheep. Uh, they don't do they don't do what they're told, uh, and there's no guarantee that people, even if they vote for the SNP and first past the post, are going to vote for another independent supporting party in the second one. Uh, and also, I think. As people have pointed out, support for independence is wider than the SNP. Take one example. I think 40% of Labour voters uh, support independence. Uh, are they automatically going to vote for SNP candidates or independence, other independence supporting candidates uh, in an election? It's not, all, not automatic. That's why the campaign's got to be wider than focusing on the parliament and wider uh, uh, than just simply focusing on political parties. But it's a, it's a broad-based campaign that in, includes everybody. The second thing I was wanting to make, and the second problem I think with it, is that there's no guarantee that, that the British state is going to accept anything. Confrontation is coming with, coming with the British state, whatever happens. If you want to know how, uh, how they're going to resp respond to, uh, to, to a, a kind of parliamentary vote or... Uh, Scotland holding its uh, own own vote. George Osborne has told told you this. He said, 
and this is a quote from his article in The Standard, there is a, a risk that the Scottish government holds its own plebiscite, but that won't be legal and the courts will stop the arms of the Scottish state like the police and the civil service taking part. Osborne has told you what will happen. Uh, he has told you. And therefore, we've got to be prepared to respond to that. And that's why we need to build the social forces in society, the trade unionists, the activists, that are able to con con confront that. That's why we need that sort of way wider support. Uh, I'm not opposed to going down the parliamentary route, but it offers no guarantees. And like I say, Osborne has show, told you how they will respond. Uh, and you can't be near, naive enough to believe that we are going to just simply do it by our uh, democratic arguments. Uh, we will need something more than that. That's what history tells us. Uh, and I, it just worries me that the naivety to expect the British state is going to sit back and allow us to have an independent Scotland without a fight uh, is going to take us down the wrong road. Thanks very much, Bob. Can we bring in Donny now? Can you unmute yourself? Oh, you're still muted. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's harder than I thought. Yeah, uh, it's following on from Bob, actually. Um, uh, elections are important, but they've got limitations. I mean, nobody voted for austerity. Nobody voted for all the test and trace and the whole COVID uh, deal to be given to Boris's friends. Elections have limitations. We've had a majority uh, for Scottish independence in Holyrood since 2007. In 2015, the, the UK election produced just one Labour MP and one Tory MP in Scotland. So elections are important, but if you look at the history of change, it, it's often without elections. I mean, T Tommy knows this better than anybody in terms of the poll tax. The poll tax was not defeated by an election. It was defeated by mass protests in the streets and it got rid of Thatcher and, and so on and so forth. If you look at the, and people have talked about it, independence movements, the vast majority have had to take to the streets. Ireland, Tommy mentioned Ireland. It was, it was, there was a hundred years of activity beforehand, the Easter rising and so on and so forth. It wasn't an election that did it. And that's why there was a fight afterwards. And, and look at India, Gandhi, whatever, you know, um, look at South Africa and so on. I'm afraid, I wish it was easy. I wish it was good enough to just vote at the next election, but we've had a majority uh, in terms of elections uh, for, for independence for, for decades. So we need to look at that other side. You know, the independence movement has to be bigger than playing the electoral game because after the Brexit referendum, the British establishment does not want to have another headache. And the chance of getting a, a referendum without massive pressure on them, which is more, I'm, you know, I'm all for voting for independence, but it will take more than voting for independence to, to get that, that right to the referendum, which we all want. Thanks, that's me. It's not a question really, it's just a point. I <laughs> Thank you very much. No, that was a good one, though. Uh, I just want to add a couple of two quick ones that I've found on social media as well. Uh, they're, they're pretty easy to answer, probably. Uh, would a supermajority force Boris to agree to a Section 30? And that's from Kevin. And also, Mary Rose Lavery has asked, would, um, we're in, is, since this is a signed voluntary union, why do we need permission? Exactly. So, Denise... Yeah, I, I actually agree. It has not been established that we need permission. And Alex Salmond was very, very careful in, before the 2014 referendum not to concede that we needed permission. So there's nothing to say that we do need permission. So I think that's, you know, a very important point. And uh, on some of the other questions, since I'm first, uh, on, regarding the referendum, the problem with the referendum is that it takes quite a long time now, Tommy says we can have a referendum in 2021, but we can't. It's too late now. There's three things that really have to happen. One is the question has to be tested by the Electoral Commission. And the Electoral Commission are not testing the question. They were asked, but then they were put on pause. And I actually emailed them and got a reply, and they're not testing it. It takes 12 weeks. So 12 weeks to test the question. And then the bill has to go through Parliament. Now, the Scottish Parliament with the Referendum Act has made that smooth that bit, but they need to put a bill in. Regardless of Martin Keaton's case, in the Scotland Act, it specifies that any bill between being passed by the Scottish Parliament 
and receiving royal assent can be challenged. So regardless of what happens with Martin, if Martin gives a bit of case law, then I think the challenge would be relatively fast, but it's quite likely to be challenged. And then it's six months the Electoral Commission requires to actually hold a referendum, because holding a referendum is very different than holding an election for the Electoral Commission. They have a lot more registered participants, like last time we had like farmers were yes, lawyers were yes. They were all registered participants and they were all spending money. So that really takes you a year. So if we get, if by um, some reason, the SNP put in their manifesto, we are going to have a referendum regardless, a guaranteed referendum. The earliest possible date would be May 2022 realistically, and that's the earliest possible. So a referendum is a lot, it will will take a long time to organise. The point about the fight, (laughs) you know, having this... So first, we are not actually ready to have an independence referendum, because as I say in my opening remarks, we don't actually have any policies unless we use the 2014 ones. But the point with the plebiscite is we can get a mandate to negotiate independence and that gives us time we can get that in May and then we can figure everything out if we don't get that mandate to negotiate independence in May then as Angus said we're going to be waiting to 2026 for a mandate now once we have the mandate in May (laughs) if we had one that would be the time that we have to have the argument and the fight with Boris. And there may be things we have to do, but there's a lot of things we can do. Like for example, our Westminster MPs, they can, they can, they have to swear allegiance to the queen. And when they do that, they get the money, they get the short money. Now the queen is queen of Scots, so it's fine really swearing allegiance to her. And then they don't have to go back to Westminster. They could stay home. And then they could just do guerrilla tactics, turn up on on mass occasionally to to disrupt things. So there's other things we can do once we have the democratic legitimacy behind us that Scotland wants independence. So that's why it's important in May to vote for independence. I hope Keith Brown is listening. Don't we all? all. (laughs) Tommy, can we bring you in now? The points that would be made by both Bob and uh, Donny have to be taken in a very important context, and that is that I think we all view our movement um, as an ego, and an ego in order to fly needs to have two wings. And we have a parliamentary wing, and we have a mass civil disobedience and a participation wing which brings the people together because Donny is right in, in, in the respects that the British state won't give up without a fight. They are risking here geopolitics. Think about this. We're committed to expelling nuclear weapons from Scotland. That's what was on the agenda in the referendum in 2014. We nearly won. Is it any wonder that they managed to get every country in the world, from China to America, to even Putin, to say that it would be better if the UK stayed together? Because they were scared stiff of the geopolitical upset that would be caused by Scotland saying, we're expelling nuclear weapons. So, of course, the British state wants to prevent the breakup of the UK. That's why I say to people across the UK. I can't understand anybody who says they're left wing, but they don't support Scottish independence because at its very heart, Scottish independence is an anti-imperialist movement. It's anti-imperialism. Anybody that's a socialist, for God's sake, you get brought up and you learn. The first thing you learn is to be anti-imperialist. can't understand why socialists wouldn't support Scottish independence. But we use the parliament We use the parliament as part of a method to build the support outside the parliament. We can't just have a single parliamentary movement and we can't just have an outside parliament movement. They need to be joined together. 
And I think hopefully all of us uh, recognise that. In relation to the point that Bob made about uh, voting um, and people following uh, a, 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 an instruction and, and, and being individual, I don't think it's a big leap of faith to call for a vote for SNP, regardless of the fact they're not a socialist party. We know that. I'm a socialist. I vote for them. I vote for them because I support independence and they're the best bet to get us towards independence. But unlike a general election, unlike 15, 17 and 19, when you only had one vote, we've got two votes. And I don't think it is a huge, huge, unsurmountable problem to get a progressive independence alternative in place for me that gives us the opportunity to elect an independence opposition in the Scottish Parliament. That's the prize here that holds the SNP's feet to the fire, that talks about the delays and the dithering and the diversions away from what they were formed to do. They were formed to promote and deliver independence. I'm afraid over this last four years, they seem to be wanting to do anything but deliver independence. I've got to say the whole idea of trying to stop Brexit from going through was far too much time and energy spent and not enough time devising policies for an independence and independent Scotland and an independence campaign. So from my point of view, and I'll finish on this point, I'll disagree with uh, Denise about what's possible. Uh, I was in the Scottish Parliament, and I remember moving a bill to return the railways in Scotland to public ownership. The RMT, the Rail Workers Union, and many other unions supported that bill. They campaigned alongside with me for that bill. And the presiding officer said, no, it's not competent. It's not within our powers to set up a Scottish body, a public body that owns the railways. It's not, it's not competent. So they wouldn't allow it. We were allowed to vote in high hedges and uh, dog fouling. We were allowed to, to vote in those things, but not to have our trains return to public ownership. So the idea of a referendum would have to go through even the presiding officer first. And the Electoral Commission isn't a body that we should rely on to uh, organise the referendum. It's a British body that has been shown through its Electoral Commission performance in relation to registration of parties that it's a biased body. We, in the Parliament, if we wanted to have a referendum before the end of the year with a super majority in May, I think we could deliver it, Denise. I think we could deliver it. And if we couldn't deliver it, then we would fight damn hard to do it and we would explain to people why it wasn't possible. I think our primary and our best route is the route that Denise and Angus have talked about. Very good Let's have the plebiscite. Let's have that vote for independence. But I'm afraid if the SNP can't be convinced to put it in their manifesto, then it's not within our power to make that a reality. Thank you, Tommy. Can we bring Ruby in now? Yeah. Um, so the last two contributors spoke about the need for extra parliamentary action um, and I think they're absolutely right and um, what Tommy said is true that we need both um, we've got we've we've got the the fight going on in the parliaments and the courts and 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 we have the potential for a huge mass movement and uh, like I said before I'm, I'm an anti-racist activist and I, I, I think we need to learn from the anti-racist movement and I want to give another example from that um, and which is about the Greek anti-fascist movement. Um, so uh, in Greece, um, there, was a, there was a fight against the Nazi party Golden Dawn and, and it took place in the courts, but it also took place on the streets. And I think um, that we can learn from that. Um, so the, the Nazi Golden Dawn party were, uh, had uh, been had uh, killed uh, an anti-fascist activist amongst um, other attacks um, and, and the police were forced to, to change their tactics as well as the, the, the state were forced to change their tactics and their approach to Golden Dawn by a, a huge movement on the streets. Um, people took to the streets, there were strikes and there was a 48, uh, the unions called a 48 hour general strike again uh, across the public sector against um, the fascist party and um, there was a 50,000 strong ra rally in Athens and after this the police and the courts were forced to change their tactics and arrest 
the leadership of Golden Dawn, and 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 in the end, uh, they were prosecuted and and they were deemed to be a criminal organisation in the courts. While tens of thousands of people surrounded the courts, breathing down the necks of the people that were making the decisions there. And that's a kind of a vision that I have for how. Uh, the parliamentary strategy can link up with the strategy of um, fighting on the streets. Um, we, we're, the, we're the real force and the weight that forces um, the people, uh, the leadership to, to act faster, to act more decisively, but also forces um, the Tories um, to have to grant us what we demand. And yeah. Thanks, Ruby. Come on then, Angus. You're muted. <laughs> That's it. I'm not muted anymore. There you go. Um, yeah, there was a number of interesting points there. It was just interesting to listen to as well. Uh, I'll try and firstly address, um, it was Bob and then Donny. Uh, Bob talked about uh, tactical voting. And I'm just saying either way, you need a mandate. Whether you're holding a referendum, wanting a referendum to, if you, want, if you want, sorry, not wanting a referendum, if you want to go and ask Boris a question, to come back and ask the people a question, you need a mandate to go and ask Boris the question. Uh, and Boris, of course, will no say no to the question. Um, so the same amount of people will need to vote for that. And if you're going to vote for independence, if you're hoping they're going to vote for independence anyway, they're going to vote for it at whatever ballot box event you offer it to them. Um, and if there are Labour voters who want independence um, but choose to vote Labour, their votes are counted and they're, and they're doing, by doing that as votes against independence. So the thing that to say to them is, well, this, this is about independence, but independence there, because uh, at the moment we're just saying it's actually a, against the referendum. It's not against independence, for the union, it's what a Labour votes for. So you want to attract the votes, the independent Labour voters away from that, and you say to them, well, immediately we get independence, we'll have another election, you can go back and vote Labour happily again, or whatever political configuration we have after independence. So we've got to do something to move things uh, along. Uh, and I think the point made about George Osborne underscores it all. George Osborne was saying that the Scottish Parliament uh, thing would be illegal, wouldn't get very far. Yeah, well, that's our point. There is no guarantee, and nobody in the Scottish Government, from the First Minister downwards, can guarantee you a referendum in the next Scottish Parliament. I can't say that often enough. There is no guarantee of a referendum in the next Scottish Parliament. If nothing else you say after this tonight, you just remind and tell your friends there's no guarantee of a referendum in the next Scottish Parliament, which is why I'm pleading that we use the election. The election on the, on the 6th of May is the only guarantee you will have for a voice, uh, for a vote to give Scotland voice for independence. Because after that, you're totally gambling. And as George Osborne knows, the one thing George Osborne uh, it was very careful again not to say is that they would not allow the Scottish people to be independent if they voted for it. He's all about thwarting the Scottish people from getting independence. Now, they're going to thwart them definitely with the Section 30. They're going to thank thwart the Scottish uh, Parliament if it passes a bill. As Denise said, you know, that between that, that period to, to royal assent, there were every device under the sun will be tried. The one thing they would and studiously have avoided saying is they would not listen or not respect the, the wishes of the Scottish nation if it was to vote for independence. So the, the, the trick for us is to make sure we get to a point where the people can vote for independence and they can do that uh, in, in May. Um, the point of permission was made. Yes, we don't need permission from Westminster, but we definitely do need permission from the Scottish people for independence. And this is where we're back to the ballot box event in May. You know, it's, it's actually not Westminster that's stopping us being independent. It's us saying the only route we will go for independence is if Westminster say yes. And as a result of choosing that one path out of the many paths we have, Westminster will say no, and then we go around saying we can't be independent. Let's choose another path. Let's choose the path of asking the people in May, do you want to be independent, and telling, telling Westminster, because if, if, if they want it, they want it. If they don't, they don't. It's going to pass at the ballot box. It is not. It depends on what the people want. And I think after the 19 opinion polls, it's going to pass. Get the people to say they want independence and then tell Westminster and tell the world this is what's happening because that's what the Scottish people have voted for. So we need their permission and nobody else's, but we must uh, make sure uh, we get uh, their permission. And the final point I've got written down, just to, as a reminder, was uh, the point Colin Jackson made earlier of the petition to the UK government and parliament. It, was a, it asked uh, the Treaty of Union... <laughs> I just put the damn thing's gone again. Uh, the Treaty of Union is no longer fit for purpose, was the petition. And they said this wasn't a matter... Uh, this was a matter for the Scottish people and not uh, the UK Parliament or the UK government. They themselves are saying it. And it's us who's inventing stuff that they'll say no. 
stop talking about legal stuff and gold standards and all sorts of stuff. Let's get on and ask the people. That's what we need to do in Scotland. And if we don't ask the people, what are we about? You know, we've got a golden opportunity in May to go and ask the people. Let's stop messing about. Ask them. Sorry, I'm losing my voice here. <laughs> Fantastic, Angus. That was that was really good. Uh, so we're we're coming to the the end of the towards the end of the the panel show. It's been brilliant so far. What a discussion! Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it. So we're going to move on to some summons up. Uh, one obviously one from each of the the panelists. I just want to highlight to 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 bring. Uh, of note again that the SNP National Assembly is on Sunday. Um, it's, it certainly was billed as a, an opportunity to debate strategy. Um, it looks like it's going to be an opportunity to, to talk about campaigning through COVID for the SNP. We'll wait and see what comes of it, but just to, to take that into account when you when you sum it up, if you want to make any remarks. So first of all, we'll go to uh, Tommy Sheridan. Thank you. Neil, thank you for the opportunity to take part in tonight's panel discussion. Um, I think all of the panel members have contributed very richly to, to the discussion, and I hope that those that have been tuning in uh, have enjoyed the experience. These, these events should be going on all over the country. Many of them have been, but we should spread them and, and make sure that we get as many people participating as possible. I had a debate the other night on uh, RT with a, a unionist, uh, a unionist who um, says he's on the left, a guy called George Galloway, who said that we can't have another independence referendum and we can't have independence because Scotland is uh, fighting COVID and that's the priority is to fight COVID. And I want to finish by making the point tonight that I made on Wednesday evening during that debate, Neil, us recovering from COVID isn't separate from independence. It's tied up integrally with independence. The return to neoliberal normal of paying wages to carers and health workers that requires them to claim benefits from the welfare state in order to survive the idea that we have over 80% of our land owned by rich landowners, many of them internationally based, the idea that our oil and gas industries are owned privately instead of publicly, that our huge clean energy resources are not owned by the government in order to harness them properly, all of that is wrong. And all of that will be rejected in the independence that we seek, an independence that puts people first, an independence that puts burns before bombs. That type of independence is only going to be a possibility if we unite, but we need to unite now and we need to strike while the iron is hot. Recovering from COVID is part of independence. It's not separate from independence. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tommy. That was fantastic. Denise, can we bring you in now? Um, so I would say Scotland has never been in as much danger in my lifetime. And I've been alive when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. This is our point of maximum danger. We're isolated from Europe and we are completely and utterly at the mercy of the right wing Westminster Tory government. We're at the mercy of them and their intent on a power grab of taking powers from our parliament. So we wouldn't have our parliament to protect us. Devolution is not accepted by the Tories. They don't see Scotland as a separate country. They see Scotland as a possession of Westminster. <laughs> we will, if we, if we don't take our chance now, this is our last chance. This is, there's a tide in the affairs of men and countries and women. And if we don't take it, you have to take it at the flood or you spend 
the rest of your time in shallows of despair. And that is where we are at the moment. We have one last chance in May. If we don't take that chance, the powers of the British nationalism, of the Tory government, they will drown us. They'll drown Scotland in a sea of Union Jacks. We face economic ruin, worse than the 80s. We're, we're cut off from Europe, our trading ties. We, our parliament will be gone. It will have no powers or it will be closed down. This is 2026. We will have no parliament worth talking about. We can't hesitate. We no longer have devolution as the option. We either give up our sovereignty, we hand it to Boris Johnson, or we start to tread the path to independence. And that path begins with the plebiscite in May. We establish the democratic will through the plebiscite in May. We declare independence. We talk to Boris Johnson. We talk to the UK government. We can do this. We like to get them to the negotiating table, and the, but we will be in so much stronger a position when we have the solid independence vote behind us. We have options. We could even declare independence without the agreement of the UK. And it would also put the UK government on the back foot because they would worry that some other country, such as Iceland, would recognize us. And they would, and they, and without an agreed deal between us and the UK, we have no debt. We don't have to take a share of the UK debt. So once we have the mandate from independence in May, I, we are in a far, far stronger position to force Boris to the negotiating table. At the moment, Boris Johnson treats us and our representatives with utter contempt. That is because he is a bully. And if people lie down and give in to bullies, the bully despises them and treats them with more contempt. And that is how we are being treated by Boris Johnson. So we have to stand up to him and we can stand up to him by voting for independence in May. That's, that's what we need to do. Thank you, Denise. Thank you very much. Now for the next, uh, we'll go to Ruby if you want to, some closing remarks, please. Great. So I think the key task of the independence movement is to intensify the mass movement. And that means linking up with and learning from the other mass movements that have been shaking the system. So that's the Black Lives Matter movement, the climate movement. Um, that's how we're going to win young people to the movement. But it's also how we're going to make sure that we're fighting for a Scotland that is radically different from austerity, from neoliberalism, from the cruelty of the British state. So I think we should be mobilizing around COP26, the massive climate conference that's coming to Glasgow this year. I think we could have the biggest demonstration we've ever seen in Scotland, linking up the independence movement with the climate movement, surrounding the conference and saying, we want an independent Scotland that will start a green revolution, that will scrap Trident, that will keep fossil fuels in the ground. In 2014, the, the movement for independence said no to war, it said no to Trident, it said that we welcome refugees. And the, the movement on the street went much further than the SNP ever did in envisioning a society that will put people before profit um, and say bends, not bombs. I think that that movement of ordinary people on the streets, in our workplaces, in our communities, is not only the force that has the power to take us to the finish line, but it also gives us a glimpse of a totally different way of running society. So that it's not just the same old system under a different flag. Uh, so that we really have a Scotland that says no to all forms of oppression and puts people's health before profit and can start to turn the tide against climate chaos. That's what I'm fighting for. And I think we have to remember what we're fighting for and use that vision to galvanize people because people will be moved to fight for independence when it offers them real change and not just a Scottish version of the same catalyst neoliberal system that's got us into this mess in the first place. <laughs> So let's learn from the militancy of the Black Lives Matter and climate movements. Let's cause havoc. Let's make Scotland ungovernable. We'll stop waiting for Boris and start forcing our hand. 
Black Lives Matter movement in the States ensured that George Floyd's killers faced charges by taking mass action. The school strikers brought the climate disaster to the fore by refusing to go to school, by mass occupations and rebellion. And here in Scotland, not so long ago, people beat the poll tax and brought down Thatcher through mass civil disobedience. That's how we win change, and that's how we're going to get independence. And I'll just end on a quote from... Frederick Douglass, the freed slave and great abolitionist, he said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Ruby. And we'll finish off with Angus. You got some summing up to do? Yes, I, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a good mention there by Ruby of Frederick Douglass, who I think t uh, travelled in Ireland in the in the nineteenth century. Well, yeah, it was. Yeah, and he was he he felt a lot of uh, sympathy for the people in Ireland to, to the plight that many of his own people I think had felt at the time the, the peasantry of Ireland. Anyway, uh, I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you. I've enjoyed listening to Tommy, Denise, and Ruby and learning from them, and I've been quite happy to be in the audience of this as well. Um, just for George Galloway, if there's a message there, George, I think we're, I've got a plan to help you. You're very worried about us having a referendum. Well, we don't want to hold a referendum. We can, we can well, we do, but you, we're not going to have it. So uh, we'll avoid the referendum problem and we'll use the ballot boxes in May, uh, George Galloway, for our independence. So that, yes, your problem will be sorted uh, there and then. And George Galloway, you need fret no more. Uh, the solution is at hand. Um, you know, we're, we're sitting in, in a situation here where well, let's look at look at history. We mentioned Ireland a few times. We mentioned the hundred years a few times. A hundred years ago, if you looked at the nations of the United Kingdom, the then United Kingdom, you would have thought the worst bet of all was Ireland. It was worse than Wales economically. It was very backward, uh, and it became independent without the, the six counties that had most of the, ind the industry in it. And uh, you fast forward a hundred years, you'd have thought, "That's where's that going? What have they got?" Think of oil, think of this, think of that, think of the next thing. You can fast forward, you can you see number two on the UN Human Development Index, Little Ireland to our west, leapfrog in the UK was about number 16, and number one is Little Norway to our east. Uh, and Scotland is in a very good neighbourhood uh, to move forward and to make things better for our citizenry, as Tommy's often saying about the poverty uh, that we have in Scotland and the blighted lives and the lack of opportunity. So that's what's at hand, that's what we can gain in Scotland. By just having a little bit of courage. We're not needing a lot of courage. I mean, I'm a real believer in he who runs and runs away, lives to run another day. Well, there's not much, there's not much to do here. It's just to say we will make the election in May, the election where we ask the Scottish people, the ballot boxes, we ask the Scottish people, uh, do they want independence or don't they want independence? We have got absolutely nothing to lose by doing that. Uh, the, Scot the SNP are probably going to be the largest party anyway, uh, and remember, the referendums are blocked. The referendums is a gamble. The referendum is the gamble. Um, some people still think the referendums will happen and talk as if the referendums are, will happen. The Section 30 won't happen and the legs will be chopped away from the other one with the advice of George Osborne and the advice of David Cameron and the advice of a number of other Tories in uh, Boris Johnson's ear. So the referendum routes will be blocked. So that leaves us 2026. So we either uh, take it or an opportunity now we move now, and remember I said we'd, we'd, we would be the biggest party. We have nothing to lose, but we have something huge to gain. We have something huge to gain if we can get the people uh, enabled to answer the question. Not asking the people, can we ask Boris a question to go back and ask the people, but ask the people directly in May and get the answer from the people. And that's the thing Westminster fears, is the answer from the people. And we'll get the answer from the people in May. After 19 opinion polls in the trot, we'll have our way to independence will be on the way then. And you know what? Our great neighbours in the South will be exactly that, good neighbours. And if we expect good things of them, I think they will live up to it. If the international community expects good things of them, they'll have to live up to it. Uh, so let's make sure we get ourselves into that groove. But we ourselves have got to take this seriously. It's us who's blocking us and blocking Scotland from moving forward. You know, at this point in time, it's, it's nobody else is saying we can't ask for independence at the election, just us. We've got a change of mindset and all of us have got to respect the ballot box. We've got to respect democracy regardless of whether that is at a referendum or at an election. And uh, as I said earlier, we can all stop our campaigning and move on to make the society better. And uh, we don't need to 
force Tommy into writing argument uh, articles anymore, arguing about how bad poverty is in Scotland because it's something we should deal with under a society that tends to be Nordic in its outlook, tends to want to have a bit of equality and a bit of fairness amongst us. Uh, so let's do that and let's have that, but we can't do it unless we get the upstream powers to do it. That's why independence is important. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Thanks very much, Angus. And I'd just like to say a big thank you to Ruby, Denise, Tommy and Angus for being here tonight. It's been a fantastic discussion. I think everybody that's watching will agree. Thank you to everyone who's contributed their questions and has joined us on the Zoom panel and on social media platforms. All I'd like to say is I think the, the, the biggest thing that we can realise from all this is that it needs to be this year. This year is the most important year within Scotland's history. This is our year and we cannot waste it. And we are going to keep having these discussions. They, they may have been blocked elsewhere, but me, all under one banner, we will keep having these discussions and we will keep having them un up until the election. And hopefully we can change people's minds. Hopefully the SM we can put a boot up the backside of the SNP. That's what I hope for from this. Sorry, Angus. I don't mean just you. I mean the whole lot of them. <laughs> but I'd, I'd just like to say thank you all for coming and I'll pass over to Neil. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks to Tommy, Angus, Denise and Ruby for coming on tonight. Uh, I've, I've personally got a lot out of this, really enjoyed it. And I hope everybody who's been in the Zoom meeting and is tuned into the live streams has as well. Um, it couldn't be any clearer, really, that the time of devolution is coming to an end, one way or another. It's either uh, the Tory government, the UK government's going to demolish it over the next few years. They've made their intent clear. So it's either going to be demolished and removed from us, or we're going to have independence. It's one or the other. There is no middle ground anymore. There's no devolution. That isn't going to last. Um, and so we have to give 100%, which everybody here is giving 100%. That's the, the infuriating thing about it. We're all behind what an, a urgent action. We want the SNP to deliver self-determination um, and not this cap-in-hand policy to Boris anymore. How are we going to be able to, to influence, to pressure, to change it? Well, we can do everything we certainly can because what, what in the end, what, what we got... Another five years, as Angus has said, to 2026. And as Denise said, what's going to be left of Scotland at that point? It's, it's uh, unthinkable, really. Um, and to be honest with you, if the SNP leadership do not adopt a self-determination manifesto, it will be unforgivable. It will be unforgivable. So the Scottish people must, uh, the Yes movement must do everything that we can to make sure that, that the manifesto is fit for purpose but not forsaking the other points about the it not just being about a parliamentary route. We've got a mass movement there that's going to back this up in the streets um, and universities and colleges uh, and workplaces. Obviously, when, when things return after COVID or through it, uh, as things ease off, but certainly that is just as powerful and just as needed as anything else. So in terms of all under one banner, I um, want to again thank everybody here tonight. As Suzanne said, we're going to keep going with these uh, Zoom panels. Um, so we'll probably keep the strategies for independence one, the same title, and we'll just go again uh, with some new panellists to be confirmed. And there'll be a whole host of other things as well. Um, we're also going to call protests and demonstrations as soon as possible, uh, whether they be at the colonial headquarters at Edinburgh or whether they be at the Scottish Parliament or indeed Butte House, uh, because this has to get ramped up big time. So certainly that's enough for all in the one banner tonight. We're delighted uh, with how this has went um, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody again at the next Zoom panel. So thanks again, everyone.